The parable today must be one of the most beautiful in all of the Gospels. But in order to understand the context of this story, we will have to talk about what came immediately before this passage. Our Lord had just sent his 72 disciples to preach in the cities that he was about to visit. And they had come back very happy at how things had gone and told this to our Lord. And our Lord gave thanks to his Father for the success that they had had. And he told his disciples that they should be happy too because their names were written in heaven. Meaning that if they continued living the way they were living, they would be saved. And at that point begins the Gospel of today, where our Lord says that their eyes are blessed because they see what they see, while many prophets and kings have wanted to see the same thing and were not able to. The entire New Old Testament was a preparation for the New Testament. All the rites and the laws and the sacrifices of the Old Testament were a preparation for our Lord and for His Church. And all the holy people of the Old Testament wanted to see what they were preparing for and they were not able to see it. Whereas, Our Lord's disciples had that privilege. As great as the privilege was that they had, we have a very similar privilege. And to a large extent, what our Lord said to his disciples applies to us too. We are blessed also because we see things that the great kings and prophets and saints of the Old Testament longed to see and couldn't see. And we should appreciate that and be happy to live at the same, at the time that we do, despite all of the problems that it has. We live in a time of grace. In a sense, we possess our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, most of all, of course. And also, we have Him in the Gospels. In the sense that we have the words that He said and, and the account of His life. And we are members of his Catholic Church. We have access to the most powerful means of grace that God has ever given to the human race. The disciples possessed our Lord in visible form in in his human body. And we possess him in the Blessed Sacrament, which is different in appearance, but not in substance. Now, our Lord said these things to his apostles, but he said them in front of a large crowd of people. And there were scribes and Pharisees in that crowd, as there usually were, who followed our Lord around, as the Gospels tell us, not in order to hear the words of life that our Lord spoke, but to entrap him and to distort his words and to destroy him. These people were so blind that they knew better than anyone else all about the law and the prophets. And they should have known sooner than anyone else that our Lord was the fulfillment of all the prophecies. But they refused to accept it because of their wickedness. Very often when people reject the truth that is right in front of them, it is not because of an honest mistake, but because they are blinded by their sins. So in this crowd there was a scribe, a doctor of the law, who was thinking how to get our Lord to say something that he could use against him. So he asked him a question. He had just heard our our Lord say that his disciples should rejoice that their names were written in the book of life. And he said to our Lord, Master, what must I do to possess eternal life? Of course, he was an expert on the law. He knew that he had to keep the commandments of God in order to do that. But he hoped that our Lord would add something more to that so that he could use that as an opportunity to accuse our Lord of making up his own rules or putting an extra burden on people in addition to the law of God. We can just imagine how our Lord was was offended and, and grieved by this question and by being constantly surrounded by persecutors like this who 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 hated him really. So our Lord simply turned the question back on him and said, 
You are a doctor of the law. You know very well what the answer is. Basically, he said, you tell me what, what the law says. And the scribe gave the correct answer that we have to love God and love our neighbor. And our Lord basically told him that he was correct and that that was how to get to heaven. This answer basically shut down this, this scribe because it didn't give him any opportunity to complain. So he kept thinking about what else he could say. And he settled on the second part of that rule about love thy neighbor as thyself. He thought he could trick our Lord into somehow distorting this part of the law. So he said, who is my neighbor? <clears throat> Most likely he knew that our Lord wanted his followers to show love and charity towards all of mankind, not just to their own people, as many of the Jews believed, and he thought that this might be something that he could catch him up on. So our Lord replied with a parable to create a context in which there was only one clear answer about who his neighbor was that would include all of mankind. So without giving him a direct answer that would be offensive to the Jews, our Lord instead created a context in which everyone who hears the story automatically arrives at the correct answer. It's helpful to know a little bit of geographical background to this story. Jerusalem is situated on a chain of hills that are fairly high. They go up as high as about 2,300 feet. And there is a main road that goes from the city itself into the valley of the Jordan. And one of the cities that this road goes through is the city of Jericho. That stretch of road is about 18 miles long. And at that time, it was infested with robbers and highwaymen. In fact, there was one place along this road that was very, very dangerous. St. Jerome tells us that it was called the place of blood. Well, sounds, sounds really bad. St. Jerome lived in this very place only a, about a couple of centuries after Christ. And he learned a lot about the Holy Land, a lot of the context that our Lord lived in. And he has passed that information on to us. The reason this road is so dangerous and, and this place of blood was particularly bad is because this is a very mountainous country, and it's very rocky and barren and remote. And there are a lot of caves in the rocks where it's very easy for the robbers to find a place to hide, and even a place to live in full time, where it would be very difficult to find them. And if they were found, it's also a place that is very easy to defend if they were ever raided by the, by the police. And this was all information that was generally known to the people at the time of our Lord. And people were regularly attacked along this stretch of roadway. So our Lord is talking about something here that is very familiar to his audience. Now our Lord says that a certain man was traveling along this road. He doesn't specify whether he was a Jew or a Gentile. He just says a certain man. Because the point of the story is that it doesn't matter what sort of person this was. He is our neighbor. And he was attacked along this road, as happens often, and he was left for dead. And then a priest went by and saw him there and refused to help him. And a Levite did the same thing. They left him there without any help at all, even though... He would quite likely die if he were not assisted. <clears throat> the reason our Lord mentioned that the two people that passed him by were a priest and a Levite was first of all to show that the priests and the Levites of his time had really lost their sense of religion and they lost their love of God and of their fellow man. They were only occupied by the externals of religion. They had lost sight of its real substance. And secondly, he made the, the villains in this story, maybe the secondary villains in this story, the religious leaders of his time, in order to show that they were the ones who were the problem. They were the ones leading the people astray, just like this man trying to, trying to entrap our Lord. 
we can understand that all of the, the Pharisees and the priests who heard this were very angry at, at how they were portrayed in this story. And they knew that it was true. And it made them want to take revenge against our Lord for saying this. It only increased their, their wickedness and their hatred. But then as this man is lying by the side of the road, a third man walks by who is a Samaritan. The Samaritans were the neighbors of the Jews, but they were very different from the Jews, both ethnically and by their language and also by their religion. They observed sort of a distorted version of Judaism in the sense that they believed in a lot of its teachings, except they didn't believe that they had to worship in the temple of Jerusalem. They had their own temples in which they worshipped, but in many other ways they were the same. But this made them a false religion. This, this was a heresy to, for them to worship in these other, other places. And the Jews and Samaritans had a terrible hatred for each other, and the Jews would insult each other by calling them Samaritans. In fact, that was one of the worst insults that a Jew could say to another Jew. You may remember one time in scripture in which the Pharisees said to our Lord, Do we not say well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Of course, they knew that he wasn't literally a Samaritan. This was only an insult. But if you think about it, those words put being uh, possessed by a demon on the same level of, of being a Samaritan. It gives you an idea of what a serious insult this was for them. But in this story, the Samaritan comes across the wounded man and picks him up and takes him to an inn and makes sure that he is taken care of and even pays for his expenses. The man was obviously just robbed, so he doesn't have any money of his own at this point. And he saves this man's life and even promises to, to reimburse the hotel owner for whatever future expenses he will incur. This is a very great act of generosity. And the Samaritan didn't ask whether this person was a Samaritan or a Jew or anything else. He, he saw someone who needed help and he exercised charity upon him. And that is an example of how we are supposed to be charitable towards our neighbor. It is important to understand, though, that when our Lord uses a Samaritan to perform this, mir this act of virtue... He's not saying that the man's religion is okay. He didn't want to promote, our Lord was not promoting religious indifferentism like, like we have today, where the modern world believes that it doesn't matter very much what your religious beliefs are, as long as you are, are good in a, in a humanistic and natural sense. This is an idea that the church has condemned and is, is uh, absolutely heretical. Of course, it matters very much indeed what we believe as far as our religion is concerned. If it didn't, our Lord would never have come and, and died on the cross and told his apostles to preach all over the world. In fact, he wouldn't have said that anyone who doesn't believe in, in the apostles' preaching would be condemned. Rather, the sense of making this heretic be what we would call the good guy of the story is similar to the story of the unjust steward that we had a few weeks ago, in which our Lord praised the unjust steward for his earthly wisdom, his, his, uh, his prudence in providing for himself in this world. And in a similar way, our Lord is praising the natural virtue of this Samaritan and holding it up as an example for us to follow, even though his religion is evil. It's the sense is, even if this, this man who doesn't even have the faith can perform this act of charity, so much the more should you, my followers. At the end of the parable, our Lord asks the scribe which of the three was the neighbor to the man who was robbed. And the scribe could only give the obvious answer to the question. And our Lord asked him that question in order to get him to admit the truth of what our Lord was saying, which is that everyone is our neighbor. And in order to, to humiliate and refute this scribe. And finally, our Lord said, Go thou and do in like manner. 
And our Lord says the same to us. So let us learn from this story and practice the acts of, of uh, kindness and charity to our neighbor. And as our Lord said, if we do those things, we will obtain eternal life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.